Hello and welcome to Williams Mullins Benefits Companion, a podcast that helps employers navigate the complex legal challenges of managing their employee benefit plans. I'm your host, Bryden DeWitt, and today I'm joined by my colleague and partner in the employee benefits and executive compensation practice at Williams Mullen, Nona Massengill. Welcome back to the Benefits Companion, Nona. Thank you, Bryden. I'm pleased to be back. Despite some of the economic uncertainty we're facing, the U.S. job market really remains hot. Nona is joining me today to discuss how employers are using certain incentives to keep those high value team members less likely to jump and what employers who are considering offering them need to know. So Nona, let's start with what types of equity incentive employers you see offered most commonly to key employees and are there any trends? So I guess what I would see most commonly are restricted stock units. We can talk a little about those and profits and trusts if the entity is structured to be able to offer profits and trusts. Restricted stock and options are still offered by employers. Um, I simply see our issues as increasingly prevalent. I think it's also important to, and we'll talk a little bit about this later in the segment, but just to really focus on you know, who you're trying to incent what they want, because again, these awards to get the most bang for your buck, you really have to know what your employees are expecting and offer as closely as possible to that your your program to meet those needs. Right. So what are the advantages of these types of incentives? Yeah, so profits and trust, the reason that I mentioned that, even though really those awards are limited to entities structured for tax purposes as partnerships, but the reason I mentioned that is the tax incentives are so compelling. They are appreciation-based awards. They can have vesting that satisfies the retention element, but if the awards are structured properly and they're held for the requisite amount of time, the benefit that's realized under the award can be capital gain. Like I said, there are requirements, but almost all of the other awards that we'll discuss today or that may be offered would have an ordinary income component to as, as part of the structure. So profits and trusts are great, and, and that's a huge advantage. Our shoes, I would say the advantage there is that they're very flexible in terms of retention elements, performance criteria, Employees still remain W-2, so they don't, and in a profits addressed award, will convert an employee to a partner so that they are not receiving a W-2 anymore. That could be perceived as a little bit of a hiccup, but it, it really is usually well worth it. But the RSUs are great because they're very straightforward and flexible. Neda, can you explain specifically what retention elements an employer might want to consider? Yes, vesting is a very important part of any equity award, and certainly if your objective is retention. Employers typically provide a continued service requirement, either lapsing, say, in one-third installments over three years, or in certain circumstances, you know, nothing vests until the end of three or five years. That's a little less common but that's an important component. Performance hurdles, especially with RSUs, are often layered over that service requirement. In a profits and trust or other appreciation-based awards, performance is kind of baked in because they only have value if the stock appreciates over the base price. But with RSUs, what I see frequently are company metrics that are deemed by the company at the time to be important financial components of the next three years. And the company, the board will take the time to determine what a target level of achievement would be. That target level of achievement would result in, for example, 100% vesting assuming services met. A lot of times you'll see multipliers so that if performance is, is really knocked out of the park up to 200% of target award levels could be earned. That's a real incentive on the upside. Usually there's a threshold below which performance, you know, is just below target. Yeah, part of the award will be earned. If it's well below target, nothing is earned. So that's a great incentive to couple with just pure service. 
Another vesting element, retention element, depending on a company's goals, is a transaction-based award. So there's transaction-based vesting, meaning that if there's an exit, a significant investment um, that provides some liquidity to founders, that if the individual is still present, part of the organization, they will participate through their RSU or other equity awards. So that's another retention and incentive element that we see. Now, how do incentives differ for publicly traded companies versus private companies? Many of the award types are used for both categories of organizations. There are, of course, differences that really relate to shareholder approval when uh, you're talking about a publicly traded company. You also see just because of the size of the organization, a lot more partnering with compensation consultants for public companies to really get a read on exactly what is most current in the market. So I, I think it's important. And, you know, I do advise on trends all the time, but a compensation consultant who that's the kind of work they do and really are just, it's their bread and butter, can advise on most recent trends. But I think that it's always important for the organization, a public company, or, you know, of course, private company to focus on what their needs are. So you learn what's in the market, but tie it to sometimes it's a particular employee, a particular, you know, person that the company wants to recruit and they have an expectation and, you know, you're, so you're, you're really balancing individual objectives with trends. With public company shareholder approval elements, another consideration is shareholder advisory firms, most notably ISS. There are very specific, you know, I'll call it bells and whistles, but just really design elements that ISS and institutional shareholders desire to see, and they can affect, you know, say you've got an existing plan, but you need to replenish your shares. You have to go to shareholders. It, you know, changes sometimes are prudent to make to the plan, sometimes very, you know, significant elements. Others are small elements, but they will be observed by ISS as part of the approval process. So that's an important consideration. Also, I will say securities elements are different and much more expansive, of course, reporting requirements for public companies. And then tax issues can be present for both public and private companies, but certainly the absence of, of ready liquidity for private entities for satisfying tax obligations or exercise price, if, for example, a stock option, is just something to keep in mind in the planning process. And then are there any other takeaways for employers? I think I would want to emphasize that tax considerations are really important, really over the life cycle of the award. Your you know, public companies are going to be C corporations, but privately held entities can take a number of different forms for tax purposes. So it's important to know what awards are available to the entity based on its tax elections. Taxes in terms of withholding obligations when awards are settled also should be pre-planned because they can you know, they can be sort of an administrative aspect of the award that can maybe be unexpected if you aren't, don't plan for it as well as a surprise to employees. So I do think that, you know, advanced thought, what might seem sort of technical, can really ensure a successful incentive program and really make the awards more appealing to key employees. Well, that'll wrap up our discussion on using equity incentives. Thank you, Nena, for joining us today. If listeners have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please contact me. You can also visit our employee benefits page at williamsmullen.com slash employee benefits. There you can find out more about our team, as well as past episodes of this podcast and legal alerts. And finally, be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when our next episode posts. Thanks for listening.